Uh, today is March 2nd, 2021. I am Daniel Erickson, and today I'm interviewing Kimberly Worrell over Zoom about Oklahoma humanities and its interactions with the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Uh, so thank you for joining me here today. Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, to get started, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, like you said, my name is Kimberly Worrell, and I am the development director at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Uh, I've worked at the Art Museum since 2013. Um, I've been in my current role for almost three years. Um, so I've worked pretty closely with the humanities over the last three to five years, and I um, really enjoy our partnership. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, so to start off, uh, how about you just tell me a bit about uh, your experience growing up and some of your like early education up through high school? Sure. Well, I am originally from Texas, um, from a suburb of Dallas, DeSoto, Texas, and I uh, went to school. I was a dancer, so I was uh, very into performing arts, and uh, that brought me to Oklahoma. Um, I was a dance major at Oklahoma City University and uh, studied there under Joe Rowan and Dean John Bedford and very much appreciated uh, the education that I received there. It was a dance management degree, so it wasn't just focused on performance. It was focused on the business of running an arts management organization or nonprofit. And the skills that I learned through that degree program and the people I met um, during that time there, and then subsequently, the alumni network has been huge for me to grow in my professional career. Um, and so I uh, started out after college doing event planning for the university uh, in the development office at OCU, and then moved to a third party event planning company. Worked there for several years and ran their events team uh, and planned events like the uh, opening of the Devon Tower and the opening of the New Myriad Gardens and really big civic events like that and really, really enjoyed that. Um, and then I got an opportunity to come work at the Art Museum and the arts are very important to me and my background and visual arts wasn't something I had as much experience in as performing arts, but was very interested in working at the museum and started out there as their event planner and moved into uh, working in the fundraising department um, at doing membership and our, our fundraising events and managing the young professionals program and now I manage our major gifts and our whole department. Okay uh, was sort of the like event planning uh, thing something that you're always interested in? Yeah, it's kind of the way my brain works. I'm a very uh, operationally focused person. I'm very into the details and sometimes too into the details, um, but I wanna make sure things are taken care of. And so um, over the last, I would say four or five years, I've really tried to focus on stepping back and thinking more strategically, but the um, operations piece of events is what I really love. So um, there's there's pieces of that in fundraising still that I can incorporate and that, that helps too. <laughs> Yeah, and so for the like the sort of event planning uh, jobs that you had post graduation, sort of uh, what did those entail, and what was sort of the like day to day work that went alongside those? Well, uh, when I worked for OCU, I did events for the alumni office, for the admissions office, for the athletics department, and for the president's office. So. Um, if the president had any uh, VIP visiting uh, for any kind of school type function, I would help plan the events surrounding their visit. Um, for the athletics department, if they had any major uh, conference tournaments that were hosted at OCU, I helped them manage the logistics behind those. Um, and then alumni and admissions departments worked together a lot on going places in the summer where there were high concentrations of both alumni and admissions, prospective students to um, go and kind of put all their resources in there together and um, visit with alumni and prospective students at the same time. So those were um, traveling events that were a lot of fun too. And then when I moved to Factor 110 um, to do the third party planning, um, I, I, I met them through working at OCU um, when the Devon Boathouse opened um, on the river. It was, it's the home of OCU rowing. And so the, the launch party for that was where I met Factor 110. And so that kind of 
hooked me in. So going to work there later and um, they just had a much larger scale of events and clients that they worked with and Devin being one of them. And so that was one of my accounts and I worked on um, any events that Devin were supposed to producing, but the big one was the opening of the Devon Tower and all of the events surrounding that. And um, it was not low pressure by any means, but it was really a lot of fun to, to plan and to be one of the first people in that building. Uh, could you explain what Factor 110 is for me? Sure, it's a uh, third party planning company and a destination management company. So they would be hired by um, a client to produce an event and it could be something as simple as the decor. It could be something um, as full service as, you know, start to finish planning the AV production um, on site at the event. Um, any kind of travel arrangements if they had VIPs flying in from out of town. Uh, it could be as full service or as minimal as, as they wanted it to be, depending on the client's budget. So really got to plan a full gamut of, of events and had nonprofit clients and corporate clients and association clients. And uh, it, was, it was a very good learning experience. OK. And uh, uh, is there a story that goes along with your uh, opportunity to work at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art? Um, well, it goes back to what I was saying about how my time at OCU uh, has given me a lot of opportunities. Um, I had a friend who I went to school with um, at OCU who was working at the museum at the time. And my former boss when I worked at OCU was now the development director at the art museum. So it was kind of a perfect storm of there was a job opening. I knew people that were there and really wanted the opportunity there and things worked out. So it was it was a very serendipitous, but um, it, and it feels like seven years has been a long time and then not a long time all at once. So. Yeah. Uh, and so you said your what was your first position at the uh, Museum of Art? The event coordinator. OK. Uh, were those responsibilities similar to what you had been doing the last couple of years? Um, so I started there doing the fundraising events. The museum has had at the time three fundraising events. So I managed all of those and then also had a private events program. So anybody that from the public that wanted to book an event space at the art museum uh, would go through me to book it. And I was their kind of venue coordinator, making sure that the venue was ready for them to come in and host their event to make sure it all got cleaned up at the end of the night. So uh, we have a really great roof terrace. And so we had a lot of weddings in the summer months up on the roof terrace. And in the winter, it's a little bit more indoors, of course. But um, it, it was a nice kind of variety between the fundraising events and then the smaller private events. OK. Uh, besides the weddings, what sort of uh, events would you be planning for that uh, position? So our three fundraising events um, at the time were the Renaissance Ball, which is our black tie gala and our biggest fundraiser at the museum, the omelet party, which is the weirdest sounding <laughs> event. Um, it's been going on for, I think this is the 37th year now, um, back when omelet parties were a big thing, like fondue parties were, uh, is how it kind of it got started. And uh, it's grown, it has about 800 people come to it each year. And it's um, an event where there's 15 or 20 chefs around the city that come in and make their own custom omelets or egg dishes. And we have an art raffle where local artists donate their artwork and you can buy raffle tickets to get a piece of local art and, and just dancing and enjoying the evening. And then we've got a third fundraiser, which is a lot more casual. It's art on tap and it's a beer drinking again, a beer drinking event. And it is, um, on the roof terrace, but all throughout the museum. It's the only event that's currently at the museum. And um, we bring in all the different craft breweries and distributors in town. And they get to, everybody gets a little teeny tiny mug that they get to walk around with. And the beer distributors pour samples into their little mini mugs and they get to taste a bunch of different beers. We usually have at least 90 different beers to sample. Um, and so it's a fun event. It's a little bit different than the others, but it's kind of geared to have to have us touch different audiences throughout the community. Yeah, those all sound pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so 
uh, as your position changed from uh, event coordinator, uh, what did you do next for uh, the Museum of Art? So I worked uh, on the fundraising events and I kind of kept that piece. Uh, moving forward, I moved from the event coordinator into uh, the assistant development director. Um, I never thought I would be doing fundraising. That was not something I wanted to do. Didn't think I would be good at it. Um, but my mentor really encouraged me and said she thought I had the right skills to make it happen. And so I um, tried it and uh, started planning um, not just the fundraising events, but working with the membership programs that the museum has um, at any given time between 4,000 and 5,000 members annually. And we, you know, work to keep them engaged and informed and enjoying the museum experience. And we also launched both the Moderns, which is our young professionals membership group, and then the Film Society, which is a similar program, but it's geared toward people who love our film program. And so um, kind of, we started developing these affinity groups for people to plug in and self-identify and say, these are the kinds of events and programs that I'm interested in at the museum. So I helped manage those and got those kicked off. And then uh, a few years later, another opportunity came up to be the development director. And I interviewed for that and um, got the position. And I've been doing that since end of 2017. Okay. Uh, what are your primary responsibilities for the development director? So I oversee our whole fundraising program. So every kind of every step that I've done along the way, I oversee all of those staff members. Um, I oversee our uh, grant writer, our membership person, uh, our event person. We have another development of another fundraiser development officer position. Um, and I focus on major gifts and getting um, new donors to the museum to support our exhibitions and our film program and our education and outreach programs. And so working with our longstanding donors, but also trying to grow the program to get more people excited about what we offer and uh, to support the arts in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask, uh, what sort of work goes into the fundraising aspect of things? Well, it's kind of a long process. Um, I always say that by the time you get to the ask, you should have, you know, the hard work's already done. Um, it's building a relationship with somebody and finding out what they're interested in about the museum and why they want to support the museum. And then finding a project or a program that most, that best fits their needs and their interests. And then continuing to develop that relationship after they've made the gift to make sure they're happy with their investment in the museum and make sure they know the impact their gift has had on the museum and the programs that we are offering that they're supporting and just staying in touch with them. And that's that's the part that is fun to me because there's a, there's an art to fundraising and there's a science to fundraising. And the science is kind of the event piece I was saying earlier, that's the operational piece and you know what's our percentage and what's our retention rate and, and how are we performing and all of that. And then there's the art of it, which is more the people piece and the relationship piece and the um, touchy feely piece. And so um, it's a nice blend of both of those. And that was also what I liked about events was building relationships with my event clients. So, you know, getting to start with a client from the beginning and learn what, what they wanted their event to look like, and then executing it for them and, and then following up and saying, how do we do? How can we make this better next time? And so there's, there's a lot of um, similarity between the two kind of job career paths that I've had. And, um, it's kind of fun to see it all kind of come together here at the museum. Yeah, for sure. Uh, earlier you mentioned major gifts as mm -hmm. something that you oversee. Uh, could you explain what those are for me? Sure. So for the museum, um, we identify a major gift as anything over $10,000. So um, I'm looking at our, our bigger gifts or bigger donors to um, kind of make a, a bigger investment in the museum. And so that requires a lot more strategy, a lot more conversation, a lot more um, relationship building there. It's a, it's a lot less transactional than, um, you know, making a $50 gift or a $100 gift or even a $1,000 gift, although a $1,000 gift is not <laughs> small. Um, but for my purposes, I'm looking at gifts typically from the $10,000 range and up. 
Um, and so that helps us kind of figure out how to divide our time as a team. I've, I've got another fundraiser and she works on that mid-range gift, which is $1,000 to $10,000. And so that's how we're able to kind of divide and conquer to get to our fundraising goal each year. Okay. Uh, yeah, is the fundraising uh, sort of the primary way that the museum is funded? Yes, it's, um, it's definitely the biggest piece of revenue. Um, we also make a lot of money off of our admission sales and from our film uh, ticket sales and our museum store. But um, it's definitely, you know, the majority of it is from the work that we do on the fundraising side. And we also have investments and things like that that help, but it's, it's mostly fundraising. And so it's a critical piece, especially in this past year when admission has been down and people haven't been able to come out and visit as much, it's been an even more critical piece to what we're doing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, how about you tell me a little bit about the museum itself? Uh, uh, sort of, you can give a just general description of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Sure. So the museum uh, was incorporated in 1945. So 2020 was our 75th anniversary year. Uh, it was not the 75th anniversary year we thought we were going to have, but that's okay. Um, yeah. We still were able to celebrate in other ways, but we were incorporated in 1945 and we've had several iterations over the years, but we started out as a WPA art gallery. Um, and in 2002, we moved to downtown to our current location. So we've been downtown since then. Um, our inaugural exhibition at the museum was our Chihuly exhibition. And it was so popular that the community decided that we wanted to buy the collection. And so they had a fundraising campaign and members of the community raised money to buy the Chihuly collection. And that's why it is now a permanent piece of our permanent collection. And, um, you know, I think that's probably what we're best known for in the community, but also regionally and nationally. Uh, we have one of the largest collections of Chihuly uh, so we work pretty closely with Chihuly Studios in Seattle. Um, we're actually working that with them right now because next year will be the 20th anniversary of us acquiring that collection. And so we're working to kind of um, reimagine it for, for the next 20 years. So uh, that's been a fun project to work on. And um, that's probably what we're best known for. But our collection is mostly American art, some European art, uh, mostly post-war art and abstraction. Uh, one of the things that we're best known for is our Washington Gallery Color School collection. Um, and about 52 years ago, I think now, um, we, were, we, we purchased this collection from a gallery in DC that was um, going bankrupt. And so uh, we purchased the collection. There was somebody that lived in DC that was from originally from Oklahoma. And so they reached out to their friends here and said, you know, we've got a great opportunity. And so the leaders of the museum at that time purchased that collection. And that is really one of the centerpieces of our permanent collection. So you've got Chihuly and you've got that. And so that's really kind of what we're best known for. Um, we have about three to four traveling exhibitions each year. So if you've seen any of our past exhibitions, this past summer we had Pop Power, which was pop art with Warhol and Liechtenstein and Coons and, and all the fun big names in pop art. And the year before that, we had Van Gogh, Monet and Degas, so a lot of impressionist art. Um, and we've had Fabergé eggs, we've had Matisse and Picasso. I mean, we it really runs the gamut. Our collection is not encyclopedic in any way. Um, and so we really bring in those traveling shows to show a more broad uh, piece of the art spectrum to the community. And a lot of times the exhibitions that we have at the museum are things that you can't see anywhere else. Our, our Matisse exhibition in 2016, uh, we were the only North American venue for it. We partnered with the, the Saint Pompidou in Paris and the Humanities Council supported that for us um, in 2016. And then this coming summer, we have an exhibition coming from Naples. It's uh, Pompeii Frescoes. And uh, again, we'll be the only North American venue for that. So that's kind of the, the big piece of the visual arts um, for our museum, but we also have a really strong film program. And uh, we screen Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and a matinee on Sunday. And we screen, you know, art house, indie, foreign films, uh, and in our theater, it's things that you wouldn't see in a mainstream 
theater uh, like Cinemark or, or the Warren or anything like that. So um, you're getting an opportunity again to see something that you wouldn't normally get to see anywhere else. And our facility that we're in um, before it was the museum, it used to be the center theater. And so the east side of our building is the former center theater. And so we still have a lot of, we have the you know original box office entrance and the art deco balustrades up to the uh, theater entrance. And it's, it's a really big part of our history too. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, moving on from that. Uh, so what was, when did you first become aware of, uh, Oklahoma humanities? So I think I actually worked with Oklahoma Humanities back when I was at OCU um, through working, you know, through the president's office at the time, Robert Henry was the president and um, he was very big on the humanities and worked with the former executive director, Ann Thompson, to put on some really great um, programs for OCU. He was a federal judge prior to coming to OCU. And so he brought in, you know, really big names across the country and across the world to talk about kind of the applications of whatever their specialty was to the humanities. And so I worked with the Humanities Council then some um, from a more limited perspective, but uh, to, see, you know, to see the programs in action through the events I was producing. And then at the Art Museum, you know, the, the humanities has been um, a big piece of what we do. You know, it's, it's art history, it's film, it's, you know, it's, it's all relating to the human experience. And so, I mean, it's, it's a very natural partnership for the museum and Oklahoma Humanities. And uh, I was looking back at our records and our records go back to 1997 um, in our uh, financial database. And that is, um, you know, we've been partners with Oklahoma Humanities that long and probably even longer, but that's as far back as our electronic records go. So, um, you know, they've been great partners. They are almost always sponsoring the next exhibition we have coming up. They're very supportive. They've also, you know, supported our film program. And so, I mean, it's, it's been a really great partnership and now they're just across the street from our facility. And so it's, it's, I see Caroline, you know, in our building a lot. And, and so it's, um, it's just a really good partnership. Yeah. Uh, so is the, nature between the two relationships, mostly financial? Um, I mean, I would see, I would say it's majorly financial, but I think there's a lot of um, conversation and collaboration and kind of discussing, you know, what opportunities are out there. And, you know, there, there are some people and some relationships that we have with donors that are, you know, we ask for the money, we get the money, we come back the next year, we ask for the money, we get the money. And that's just how the the funder prefers for that to operate. And that's not the case with Oklahoma Humanities. You know, they're normally supporting a program that we're doing. And so they're attending it, they're inviting their board to it. They're promoting the program in the community. I mean, it's it's a um, it's a really nice fit. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Yeah, you mentioned that Oklahoma Entities helps uh, like sponsor a lot of these uh, exhibitions and exhibits that uh, come through. Uh, what's sort of the process behind that? So they have a series of grants that they offer. Um, and each year we apply for, um, they have a fall cycle and a spring cycle and we apply both cycles if, if we have a, an exhibition that fits. Um, with within what what we're trying to apply for and and what their requirements and eligibility is um but typically it is and so we we apply in the fall and in the spring for our exhibitions and um we typically have some kind of lecture that's free and open to the public that is hosted by you know some kind of scholar in, in that area in that field and so um you know, if, if it's an American art exhibition, we would want to have a scholar that is, you know, an Americanist and, and that kind of thing. And so um, there's a wealth of knowledge across the country in these areas and, and museums are very uh, collaborative with each other. And so um, if an exhibition is touring around the country, there's a good chance that, you know, the scholars from that field are aware of it and want to participate and want to, you know, talk about their fields too 
the community here. So it's, it's a great fit. Yeah, and uh, on your end, how does the uh, grant process sort of work itself out? So there's a um, like there's a draft period where we put together a draft form of our grant request, and the program officer reviews our grant and comes back to us with questions that they have or things that um, maybe we didn't fully answer or things that they'd like some clarification on. And then we have a, a few weeks to clean it up and then present a final draft, uh, you know, for each cycle. So there's a draft and then a final uh, for each one. And then it's reviewed by their board. And then we find out if we were funded for that opportunity. Um, and the ones that we apply for are challenge grants, which means that um, if it's a $10,000 grant that we receive from them, then we have to match it with another $10,000 from another donor. So, um, and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, one donor 10,000, we can, you know, accumulate it however we need to, but it has to meet that threshold that they're supporting. So we have to have somebody else in on it too, uh, somebody else with some skin in the game, I guess, so that um, Oklahoma Humanities isn't the sole partner for it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are there any current or recent uh, programs that have been funded uh, in part by Oklahoma Humanities that are you know, of interest? Yeah, so our upcoming one is our summer exhibition, uh, The Painters of Pompeii. And uh, I mean, the exhibition alone is a humanities dream project, I think, because it's art history. And so, you know, everybody has heard of Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius and that history. And so these are frescoes that were preserved through the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and the uh, kind of through line of the exhibition is the perspective of the artist and why they painted the frescoes and um, kind of their process. And so we're able to, through our educational programs, but also through the interpretive elements that we put into the galleries with our labels and didactics, we're able to kind of tell the story. And that's, that's really the humanities piece of it is, is telling the story of the exhibition um, through, through various manners. And so, you know, we have a lecture series that we're doing. We're bringing in different scholars on different um, areas of Pompeii throughout the summer. So one per month. And so the community is, uh, is supporting that. Um, and so, you know, there's a topic on food in Rome during that time period. There's a topic on um, women in Rome during that time period. You know, there's different uh, focuses. And so you can either come to all of them if you'd like, or you can come to one, uh, you know, or pick and choose. And so it's, um, it's a, it's a, you know, oratory way for us to tell the, the history of the town and, and of that region in Italy, um, in addition to just looking at the art on the wall. And that's important to us for, for our visitors to engage with the art, to leave with an understanding of what they saw um, and to want to ask more questions about it. Okay. Uh, going back to the grants, uh, uh, is there a, uh, are there specific things that uh, you feel that if you apply for a grant that you're more likely to receive support for, or are they generally uh, willing to go along with uh, whatever it is you're looking to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we always meet with Caroline um, and typically the program officer um, before we apply for an exhibition or you know for any of the grants. And we talk to them about what we have upcoming and you know here's kind of what we're thinking. And it's been a while since we've done a lecture series in this format. We typically um, just do one lecture kind of on our opening weekend to kind of kick off everything, but this is a little bit unique. And so we're bringing in some additional scholars to talk about Pompeii. And so, you know, it was a new opportunity. It was a new type of program for them to fund. And so we visited with Caroline to talk about, you know, what, what we were excited about and why we wanted them to support it. And, you know, she was all on board and um, wanted to help us promote the exhibition too through the magazine and through the podcast. And, and so, um, that's kind of how, how we get started with the grant is visiting with Caroline to share about the exhibition, why it's important and what we'd like to ask for. And then we get direction from her and then start the application process. 
Uh, and you mentioned before that uh, the museum usually applies for the spring and fall cycle of grants. Mm -hmm. uh, so is the like uh, grant application process for these traveling exhibits sort of an annual thing? Yeah, so um, it depends on how far out we have our exhibitions booked, but we're trying, we try to be at least three years booked out for our exhibitions. And so that gives us some flexibility with uh, reaching out to funders. You know, we apply to the NEA for funding, we apply to the NEH, we also apply locally to their affiliates with Oklahoma Humanities and Oklahoma Arts Council. But the, the federal grants have a longer lead time. And so we have to be thinking further out on that, you know, usually at least 18 months out. And so we work on, on the you know exhibition budget and the programming and the exhibition concept and get everything really tight and ready to present to funders so that um, we're always kind of thinking further ahead and kind of have our plan in place um, before it's time to present the exhibition. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so just sort of in a general sense, how do these, uh, the grants that you receive from Oklahoma Humanities uh, impact the Museum of Art? They're significant. I mean, they're considered a major gift for us. Um, they are, you know, critical to us presenting exhibitions that are the high quality exhibitions that our community comes to expect from us. And we couldn't do it without partners like Oklahoma Humanities. You know, there are exhibitions that everybody wants to support like the Pompeii exhibition or the Matisse exhibition, but then we are also have other exhibitions throughout the year that are just as important, but maybe don't have as big of a budget or don't have um, as big of a name, you know, recognition element to it. And so it's important for us to show those exhibitions too and have just the support behind it to make it possible. And then for us to continue to bring in exhibitions like that, um, you know, for, um, us to bring in an exhibition like Gehinde Wiley in 2017, that was huge. And that was before he was a big name. And so not a lot of people knew who he was, you know, it was hard to, you know, convince people that they needed to come see this exhibition. And now I would think he's pretty much a household name having painted Barack Obama's portrait. And so, you know, you want, you want people to trust you. And I think trust is important with the community and with the art museum and with funders. But you also want them to take a chance sometimes too, so that you can bring in exhibitions that people maybe might not understand, but maybe they learn more about it and it opens their eyes to something new. Yeah. Uh, for these traveling exhibitions, uh, how long do they normally stay uh, at your museum? It's usually about a 90 day run. Um, and then we usually have at least six weeks down, sometimes eight weeks down between exhibitions, depending on how big the next exhibition is or how long it takes to deinstall. Um, but typically we have, you know, three months worth of, of show time for an exhibition. Okay. And uh For, for the, all these traveling exhibitions, do they all require uh, grant money to be attainable or are there other ones that are, I don't know, not as expensive, I guess? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, we, we plan our exhibition calendar in such a way that it's manageable for our annual budget. You know, I mean, there, we, we can't do a blockbuster exhibition every year uh, maybe every three years. Uh, so you've got, you know, we had Matisse in 2016 and then we had Van Gogh in 2019, you know, see, so we kind of spaced those out a little bit, but that doesn't mean that Warhol doesn't have as big of a name recognition. It's just the cost of that exhibition is a little bit less, but, um, you know, even if the rental fee is waived for an exhibition, a traveling show, um, or we have some kind of great deal that we're working on, um, you know, it still requires funding from it. You know, we try to raise money from an underwriting standpoint, you know, for a big portion of the exhibition costs. And then the rest of that is made up through uh, admission dollars to buy tickets to come see it. And then through um, membership revenue. So if a member is helping us kind of offset some of those costs too, through by being an annual member. 
Okay. Uh, so beyond the uh, grants themselves, uh, how would you describe the relationship between the Oklahoma City Museum of Art and Oklahoma Humanities? I think it's very collaborative. Um, I would guess, I'm not certain, but I would guess that we're one of their larger funders in the state, um, you know, just being a large art museum and, and having a larger annual budget. And so I think that, you know, we work really closely, you know, Caroline and I probably talk once every six or eight weeks um, with an idea she has or maybe an idea we have. And, you know, that's that's in between the formal process of visiting with her about a grant that's coming up. And so I, I would say that our relationship is very collaborative um, and very open, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're kind of always spinning ideas off of each other and, um, she's always kind of using us as a temperature gauge to, you know, how, how would this work for you to kind of see if it would even be possible for a smaller organization. And, and so it's, it's a very collaborative, very uh, productive relationship. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, so I guess at this point, uh, just go ahead and ask you if you have any uh, other thoughts about Oklahoma Humanities or the humanities in general that you'd uh, like to share that you haven't been able to yet. I would just say that we really enjoy the relationship and we hope that it continues far into the future and really enjoy the staff and the board at Oklahoma Humanities. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, if you uh, feel like you've shared everything that you want to, uh, I think I've covered what I set out to. Okay, that's great. Well, this has been nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Of course. Let me know if you need anything else. Yeah, for sure.